Hi again, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Hope From Home, the show where we bring you conversations of hope from our home to yours. Today, Noel Oko speaks with Carl Haytu of the Catholic Near East Welfare Association and learns how the pandemic is affecting Christians in the Middle East. Luisa Florentine then speaks with Therese Lape Nazareno, whose mother was sick with coronavirus. Then, Sister Marie Paul Curley of the Daughters of St. Paul gives Deacon Pedro some movie watching advice in this time of self isolation. And of course, they'll all tell us where they're finding hope from our home to yours. Hello, Carl Hattu. Thanks for joining us all the way from Gatineau. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Noel. As the Canadian National Director for the global charity Kaniwa, Carl, I was hoping that you can, you know, maybe give us some insight on how the church in the Middle East is helping during this time of pandemic. Yes, as you know, uh, this uh, uh, no place on earth is escaping this uh, new virus, and the Middle East uh, certainly isn't. Uh, the problem in the Middle East, as uh, you know, is uh, it's been in chaos, um, you know, since 2003 in Iraq, since 2011 in Syria. It created war, conflicts, uh, millions of refugees going to Lebanon and Jordan. So the whole Middle East has been deeply affected, and, and the church has been deeply affected as well. But at the same time, it has responded very well, very well to the refugees, to the poor, the new poor that happened locally in Lebanon, for example, or in Jordan. Um, the economic chaos that created that as well. So, so the church always has been with the people, the most needy people. And we've been working in, as an agency with the church in each one of those countries, including Gaza and Palestine, uh, where there's this conflict with Israel that's still uh, happening as well. So mm -hmm. the pandemic is no different. Uh, what is different is the church has to change its way of working. Uh, like here, all the churches had to close down. I mean, in Syria, even the bombs did not close the, 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 the churches. Some closed, of course, but most of the church always were there to do ministry. Now, because of the virus, the church has closed down. Same thing in Iraq, same thing in the, the Holy Land, same thing in Jordan and Lebanon. And so it's been very difficult for the church this time around to really respond uh, in the way it wants. But the health clinics are still open, food distribution is still open, and guess who's going there? The Lebanese are going there in mass, uh, not just refugees or migrant workers from the Philippines that work in Lebanon or work in Jordan that are losing their jobs. So, so the church, yes, is very much vibrant, very much present uh, towards the needs of, of the people locally. Can you talk to some of the projects that Kaniwa is sponsoring in the Middle East, uh, even during these difficult times? Uh, you know, uh, if we take the example of, uh, of Lebanon, um, before this pandemic, uh, in, even before the Syria war, you had the Good Shepherd Sisters uh, that in Beirut, Lebanon, opened a uh, health clinic to help mm -hmm. out the poor neighborhood of Lebanon. When, the, uh, when this uh, war uh, started in Syria, and uh, uh, Syrian came by the thousands if in, in a million, and same thing in Iraq, tens of thousands of Iraqi refugees came to uh, Beirut, Lebanon, they, were, went, they went to see the sisters at the health clinic that also do food distribution and et cetera. With the pandemic, what we see happening is uh, compared to Canada, where you know uh, people have subsidies, uh, business have subsidies. Um, in Lebanon, there's no such things as subsidies to people. So if you lose your job, thousands of them have lost their job. What you see happening is they go right into poverty. And mm -hmm. where do they go and see the Good Shepherd Sisters, they go and see the Franciscan Sisters, they go and see all those other religious sisters in the church that has already put in place, thank God, um, all those uh, food distribution system in place. But now there's just that the numbers are doubling, tripling, quadrupling mm -hmm. with people that require aid. And that's where we are coming along. We're continuing our aid to that particular health care and many others across the Middle East. But that one in particular is of course, booming with problems. And you can just imagine uh, the refugee families that have, and, and local poor that have barely access to water. How can they wash their hands? Uh, washing your hands in places like this is almost impossible. Uh, to do social distancing. How can you do this with a family of four live in a one bedroom apartment? Uh, so density, people density is a major problem in Beirut. 
Uh, and so what you have happening is how can you control then the virus? Uh, there's no testing. Uh, Lebanon is not equipped like most countries like in Iraq or Syria or, or even Palestine are not equipped to do testing. So there are all those people walking in the streets, uh, even though shouldn't work, have to go to work under the blanket, you know, like in, a, in what we call in the in black market under the table to survive. And so you know, the virus is just spreading. Mm, I see. Are there any inspiring stories of faith coming from the Middle East that you can share with us? Well, you know, I think the, the, the stories and the era, the Eric people uh, are certainly people working in the health system. So the Good Shepherd Sisters, of course, if you go in Bethlehem, uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, Bethlehem uh, Hospital, a Catholic Hospital that's there as well that we're supporting in Beth Sahur in particular. And, you know, they, they care very much with the people. And once again, if you look at Bethlehem, you have a situation where about a month ago, six, seven Bethlehemites uh, got uh, the, the pandemic, the virus from a Greek tourist uh, that were visiting the Holy Land. And right away, the Palestinian Authority put some very severe measures, regulations to stop movement of people. And so what happened is, of course, tens of thousands of people, of tourists, left Bethlehem. That means no income anymore. And, and so uh, the, the church, local church, with all its infrastructure, were able to feed the people um, but uh, it's it's winding down. You need more aid, more support in order to do this. So so the, the brave people are the people on the ground uh, with the church uh, that are really uh, putting their life at risk to feed people, to also minister to them. And you know, it's life as usual. People still die. People are still sick with cancer. People have issues with the occupation from Israel. Uh, if you go in Syria, the bombing continues in Iraq. Uh, all those problems, and so the Aero are really the one providing all the care uh, in those really, really harsh times, and it's all the religious sisters, uh, whether it's the Dominican sisters in Iraq, uh, you have the Good Shepherd sisters I mentioned, all those sisters are, are doing some amazing life work once again, once again, yes. No, that's, that's absolutely incredible. Well, one last question I have for you, Carl, today is, what gives you hope personally during this difficult period? Well, you know, uh, if we look at uh, the people in Canada, I think we've uh, realized, and, and some studies have, have, have been already uh, are coming out, and, and ourselves as an agency, we've seen it, have been sending emails to inform people about our program, how the program is affecting so many people, and inviting people to pray. And what I see among Canadians, uh, like usual, coming forward uh, with a great generosity, spirituality, uh, especially Catholic Canadians, and, and I think this has shown the sense of the one global world we live in today, and the awareness that if we go through hardship here, can you believe other people must have less? And and what I've seen is the hard work locally as well, uh, in all over the Middle East, in Ethiopia, in India, in Ukraine, all the countries we're in, and, and I think the hope lies into all those people that uh, want to survive but wants to have a better a better uh, a life uh, in the future. And I think there's a great learning in this. At the same time, people that can help, that can support Kenya One, can support all that great work on the ground, uh, I invite people to do so if they can by visiting, of course, our, our website. And, and, and this just helps continuing uh, to keep people in dignity that are going through so much hardship all over the world right now that have absolutely no means to support each other because their government does not have the means. For those who want to help, Carl, can you let us know what the website is that uh, they can connect to? Yeah, but our website is uh, cnewa.ca. So cnewa.ca. And in there, you'll have uh, different updates from some of the countries we're talking about. Uh, yes. There's also the donation page, some reflection text, and we also have a Facebook, kenewa.ca, um, where we have a lot of uh, different... Uh, interviews and, and testimony as well. Listen, Carl, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. It's, it's really been great talking to you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's all pray uh, the Virgin Mary, as the Pope is inviting us to do. Uh, it's lost time. It's a time to be in solidarity. It's a time to be of service to other people. 
So if we all do that, caring for one another, I think we'll get out of it much, much better than we were before. Hello, Therese. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so for people who haven't seen it yet, you actually wrote a public post on Facebook last March, uh, basically breaking the silence about your mom's experience with COVID-19. Um, so for one, how is your mom doing lately? She's doing really well. Thankfully, she was discharged from the hospital as of March 28th. Um, and so she's at home right now, self-isolating and continuing her care. So the only person that's actually in contact with her is my dad. And by contact, I mean he brings her meals and anything else that she needs and he kind of leaves it in front of um, her bedroom door. And other than that, she is totally isolated. So what motivated you to speak about your mom's experience on a public platform like Facebook? So actually, it was something that I was battling for a really long time. Um, there was this, there is this stigma with patients that have uh, coronavirus, mm -hmm. and I was weighing out, you know, do I speak on a public platform about something mm -hmm. so personal? Um, is it worth it? Is it going to bring about negative? Uh, energy or negative, sorry, attention, and I didn't want that. But after praying about it for a couple nights and really wrestling with it, mm -hmm. um, I came to the conclusion that, you know what, I'm just going to speak my mind. And I've had a few of my friends who are healthcare professionals actually reach out to me and say, you know what, this totally reflects what we see at the hospitals. I think mm -hmm. it's important that people see um, a face to this virus and it's yeah. not just, you know, like numbers of patients mm -hmm. um, and just so that they can take it seriously. Uh, so I made it public and I did not expect it to reach as many people as, as it has. And, you know, I've had people message me and say, thank you for sharing your story. You know, I never, really took it seriously but now after seeing your your post um, i'm going to really take into account you know what social distancing means and what i can do to help um, flatten out the curve if you go back like there's over 1000 shares apart from like the comments and stuff so obviously people are really taking this to heart and you know just as you were you know telling me about all this um what just uh came to my heart right now is actually the story of um, the lost sheep and, you know, how like Jesus went back for that one sheep out of the hundreds. So um, obviously to God, like it's important for us not to get lost in the numbers and to care that to care about them in the sense that these are people being affected. Mm -hmm. They're not just numbers for sure. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, so how do you think um, God remains present in your family right now, even in this very, very difficult situation. So I actually am I'm married. I have a daughter and um, my husband and we live with, with my family. And up until uh, coronavirus hit my family, we were all very busy and living very separate lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when once my mom had to be hospitalized, it really jostled the family mm -hmm. and we had to come together. And because we couldn't see my my mom, we couldn't visit her. Um, we had to find a healthy way of coping. I think because it happened during the Lenten season, mm -hmm. um, our reaction wasn't. Of course, we were devastated that my mom was affected, but at the same time, we all kind of thought to ourselves and, and said, you know what, this just makes um, this year's Lenten journey a very personal one, um, yeah. you know, to really be united in Christ's suffering. God was really present because he helped us to get through the challenge of um, just, just coping, just coping with the emotional stress that comes with having a member that's affected by this virus. Um, because you, you just don't know if you're going to get that phone call, you know, and, and that was something we were really, um, worried about something that didn't really happen before this, this whole endeavor, again, with just busy schedules, but to, you know, pray the rosary together, to, mm -hmm. to go to mass together, um, you know, to do the divine mercy together as a family. And I think um, in a way it was a wake up call for a family and just kind of God saying, you know, um, there's so little that you can do in the situation mm -hmm. because we can't physically help her. But what we can do is come together um, in, in prayer and in solidarity and, and really just 
be a family unit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing to hear really. And it's beautiful that, um, you know, the mystery of our faith is when we experience great suffering in that suffering, you know, we are more intimately connected with Christ because through his cross, through his passion, um, that's when he, you know, shed out his um, love for us really. Um, so actually your experience really reminds me a lot about Mama Mary as well, because um, she had to go through um, seeing firsthand her own son's um, suffering on the cross. Um, so did you find comfort in Our Lady at all during this time? Um, not just as a daughter to your mom right now, but as, as you mentioned, as a mother yourself to your own child. Yep, so actually I have a devotion to our mother. Uh, and I really just pondered on how she could see her son suffer. Okay. And if you look at the image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, you know, there's like fire that comes out of her heart and it's this intensity of her love for God. And yet there's also a sword that pierces that heart. But how did she continue to live her life um, without that fear crippling her? Mm -hmm. If anything, it allowed her to, to really continue to blossom as um, as Jesus' mother, um, and to continue living her life and not let it stop her. And I think when I look to that, um, I, I said to myself, you know, I wish I had that strength. And so my prayer became, um, you know, Mother Mary, help me to, uh, for, you know, to, to suffer in silence, but to suffer with purpose there's a temptation to kind of see it as like this great devastation. But I think the good thing about us as being Catholics is to not focus solely on the cross, but what happens after the, the, the crucifixion. And that's a, that's a resurrection. And that's why, it, again, as I said, this Lenten season is such a personal journey for me. So lastly, what message would you give to um, people who are having a hard time, you know, as they're trying to make sense of, this time of uncertainty right now, what would you say to them? You know, as Catholics, we have to look at um, what is a healthy way for us to cope with this and how can we continue to grow from this? Um, and really what is God calling us to do? Why is he shaking us up? And so I think because the virus really affects a lot of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, how can we be more purposeful over their time? And how can we lift up our anxieties and our worries to God, this is our time to um, to be together and to really continue to grow in our faith and to be hopeful that um, this doesn't end here, that this is for something greater. Thank you so much. I really appreciate like just even the energy that you have right now and the passion and the joy, really, I see all of that um, in you. Um, and people who don't know what like the suffering that you, your mom and your family are experiencing wouldn't see that in you right now. And I think that's the fruit of, as you said, um, finding purpose in this time and finding hope. So I hope that um, people who are in the same boat as your mom or your family, who are directly or indirectly exper experiencing coronavirus right now, um, that they always cling to the Lord because um, he's our hope right now. Um, and we're all looking for hope. So um, with that, thank you so much again, Therese, for joining us. Um, and I wish you and your family all the best. And I will for sure keep praying for your mom as she continues to recover. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Sister Marie Paul Curley, it's so good to have you with us. You're, you're a member of the Congregation of the Daughters of St. Paul. You're also a screenwriter, you're an author, you're a writer, you're a movie expert. And that's, I think, I mean, there's so many things that we could have you talk about, but I think that because we're all stuck at home trying to figure out what to do, and there's probably not a lot of great stuff on, on Netflix, but you can give us some tips of some good movies that we could be watching during this, uh, during this time of self-isolation. Yeah, it's it's important to watch things that can really uplift us and help us even to celebrate uh, Sunday, to celebrate Easter. And one of the things, you know, I recently read a newsletter from a Christian writer that uh, who reflected that 
everything that she reads or hears right now is about the coronavirus. She's and I, you know I was watching a, the tiny beginning of um, Frozen Two. And I kid you not, the opening song could be about people who are who oh, are going no. through this. That's terrible. Yes. So you I see know. it everywhere. You can see it <laughs> everywhere. And so what what will inspire us? What will help us to live this time? And you know, in times that I've really struggled with uh, difficult moments, whether it's been grief or illness or you know uh, the illness of a loved one, has been movies about self sacrificing love. And okay. the reason I choose that is not just because that is, uh, uh, it's a theme really of Holy Week and Easter, but especially because all of the love that we experience with our loved ones and that we read about and listen to and watch in movies is just a tiny glimmer of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna challenge everyone here to watch some of your favorite movies watch some of those movies that really inspire you. Uh, this is a time to go back to those things that really strengthen you. And I'll share yeah. a few of my favorites okay. uh, and look for glimmers of God's love. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start with a couple of my favorites. Okay, and cool. uh, Deacon Pedro, if you have one that you want to jump in with, that's cool too. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> one of my very favorite films is the classic A Tale of Two Cities. And there's a lot of different screen versions of them, but it's a really powerful story of self-sacrifice. Uh, mm -hmm. You can look at, at other classics like To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, which is one of my favorite films with Gregory Peck, yes. or you could look at uh, the wonderful Les Miserables, uh, especially last year's miniseries that's so mm -hmm. powerfully done. But you know, I've also noticed that most, many, I shouldn't say most, but many of the hugely, hugely popular films, I think. I think back to Titanic when that first release. I think of the Twilight series. I think of Harry Potter. All of these characters, all of these stories have a strong element of one of the main characters offering or risking their lives out of love for the others. So I, you know, it's really cool. You see it everywhere when you start to look for it, whether it's Disney's animated films, uh, even some of the wonderful Japanese anime, anime films like Spirited Away right. uh, is so beautiful in that regard. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you can, of course, go to some of the religious classics like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia series. That's mm -hmm. an amazing depiction of a, a referral to the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, okay. but done in an allegorical kind of a way. Yeah. And then you have, you know, things like Lord of the Rings or the more recent A Quiet Place, you know, that oh, yes. thriller that that's filled with these themes oh. of self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, the biopic Harriet that we talked about last month or two months yeah. ago, even um, the very quirky uh, abominable that, mm -hmm. that came out this past winter. Okay. The, two of the characters are yeah. really, they make sacrifices for others out of, out of love for them. So, and again, just letting these beautiful uh, characters and themes kind of enrich us and go back to some of your favorite movies. I bet you'll discover that some of your favorite characters are uh, inspire you because of that that desire to lay down their lives for others. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of other good ones. Saving Private Ryan, Casablanca, one of my all-time favorite films. Like, oh, the Star Trek series. The, the Star Wars, Harry Star Potter. Star Wars. Oh, right? my goodness. I mean, you, know, you know what? It's a good – you're making me think that there must be something about that human uh, quality – can we call it a quality that we have this ability to sacrifice or desire or longing to give our, ourselves – for someone else but because it seems to be in a lot of films in a lot of stories right yes it does and i think it's because love is the the most universal i mean it's the most it's where at our best it's where our most we're most human mm. and we're most in the image of god is when we're loving in that completely selfless way you know mm. and in the day-to-day -day, i mean mm. even one of the things about movies is that you can see uh the dailiness of self-giving love too. 
you know, um, I, I saw recently Jojo Rabbit and there's little oh. scenes in there that, you know, you can just see this progression of these characters to learning how to love yeah. in an, in a, in an atmosphere of hostility and hatred, persecution and, and murder. Uh, yes. Very, very powerful. Yeah. So yeah, that universal, that universal human quality. Um, yeah, that, yeah. that makes us most like God. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And maybe that's why it's written in our hearts that we that we it's a, one of our deepest longings. And I, I was thinking that you were going to give us some not that I actually I wasn't thinking that you would give us all these pandemic movies that we should be watching. But I bet you that in those movies, Outbreak, Contagion, oh, yes. that they're full of self people self sacrificing and making making choices that are are sacrificial. Um, interesting. And yeah. I'm, I'm, this is a okay, so challenge to our, 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 our viewers and our listeners. Um, watch whatever movie you're going to watch tonight and look for that quality of self-sacrifice is that is that the challenge is that yes yes Good. and and pick one of your favorites and look for that self-sacrificing love in it i bet you'll find it okay we're going to do that thank you sister marie paul that's good that's a that's good suggestions for us today have a blessed rest of the easter season Thank you and you and everyone uh, at Salt and Light and everyone who participates in the Salt and Light broadcast, you all are in my, my prayers and the prayers of our sisters. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Marie Paul Curley. She's a member of the Congregation of the Daughters of St. Paul. You can read her blog at windowstothesoul.wordpress.com and you can follow her at Sister M. Paul. And that's all for today. It's so important as we go through this crisis that we don't forget that there are people in other countries that are probably suffering much more than we are. Thank you for the work of Catholic organizations like Catholic Near East Welfare Association. And what did you think about what Therese was telling Louisa? They say that by the time this is all over, we're all going to know someone who was sick with the virus, but we're not there yet. Do you know someone who has been infected? Also, what did you think of Sister Marie Paul's suggestion for watching movies? You didn't think she'd say that, right? Well, I'm definitely going to start looking for moments of self-sacrifice in every movie that I watch from now on. But maybe not watch too many movies. Share your stories with us by following Salt and Light Media on all of our social media platforms and commenting with the hashtag HopeFromHome. Share where you're finding hope during this time. If you missed any part of the episode and you'd like to watch it again, visit our website, saltsandlighttv.org slash hopefromhome. We hope that these stories inspire you to stay positive and remind you that we're all still connected together through hope.